We can't say we're back because we've been gone for ages. Right, All right man. We're back. Make yes. it Mastermind Podcast. This week we've got another special guest. We've got James Priestley. James, yeah. how are you doing? Yeah, awesome. Cheers for having me. Yeah, so uh, if people don't know anything about you, do you want to give us like a quick bio yeah. and then we'll get into it? Yeah, of course. Well, I suppose I'm here now because the biggest thing I've ever done in my life was winning SAS Who Dares Wins, the last series, mm-hmm. which was pretty good. I was expecting a round of applause then, but whatever. Yeah. We'll, f- <laughs> we'll, uh, <laughs> we'll <laughs> 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 But uh, yeah, everything leading up to it. So um, born and bred in Keighley in Bradford. Um, and then when I was 14, moved over to York. Um, <coughs> family, obviously, in Bradford, not known for, for the right reasons, really. So come into a bit of money when, when we were 14 and it, it changed my life and how I viewed everything. But you still keep that sort of um, resilience that mm. coming up and coming in, in Keighley. I'm not saying it's a... It's an, uh, not a nice place now, but at the time it was not a nice place. Um, so it does, it hardens you to stuff. And you've got no choice really but to be that sort of person. And then changing to go into a private school at 14, it just flips it on the other side. And I would love for everybody to experience what I've experienced, which is both ends of the spectrum really. Because mm. it sort of moulds you into into who you are. And then, um, yeah, for the last sort of 10 years, I've had my own business in property and that's one of the reasons as well why I wanted to go on the program to uh, to try and find out who I was because, like I was mentioning to Julian, that uh, y- you can be whoever you want to be when you've got your own business. You can prepare as much as possible for every single situation. So I do. You're a bit of a chameleon. You be different people to get the right results. Um, so going on this program was because I was a bit torn as to what sort of person I was and, yeah, c- come out with a bit of clarity, really. So pretty cool. Wow. Do you know there's a lot to I'm about excited, there. man. <laughs> <laughs> Let's take it back to the beginning. So yeah. back to your to your school days. What was your, your, your early school days like? Were you good at school? Were you smart? Yeah. How were things? I was sort of average, just sort of all the way through. Um, not too bad at sport. I enjoyed doing sport. But the, the biggest thing for me was sort of social status, which I think is the biggest thing for a, a lot of kids and a lot of teenagers, that you want to be the coolest person. Um, and that gives it gives you a lot of power as well. So at the time, my family were known for being like a bit of a gangster family. Um, so you got a lot of respect anyway, mm-hmm. just because of the surname. And uh, But also, because that's all you know, you think that that's cool. And I see it every single day in this day and age that um, when someone's dad and their dad before them and their granddad are known for being fighters and stuff like this, it just trickles through the DNA spectrum and they want to be known for being fighters or stepping in the dad's shoes, you know, for being a, a, a nasty lad around town and don't mess with them. Mm-hmm. Whereas it's a real adolescent approach to life and you only know that when you, your world changes, which is what happened, you know, when I was sort of 14. But yeah, back over um, back over Bradford Way, um, grew up in Braithwaite, which um, it is, I think it's not too bad now, but at the time back then it was really bad. You know, you don't stay out sort of after dark. Um there's no like zombies or all, but it's just like, you know, you, you probably get smacked <laughs> by someone. But, uh, but yeah, so, uh, and then um, it got to a point where uh, quite a few things were happening. My, my dad was in and out of prison sort of my whole life. And there's, there's people, it became quite normal, you see. So I can remember an earliest experience in Bradford. It must have been about four or five maximum. And uh, we'd just come back from the supermarket with my mum me and my brothers, and we came into the kitchen and there were just a, a gang of men on the kitchen table that had broke into the house with balaclavas on and they had some sawn-off shotguns on the table as well. And then before we knew it, the door shut behind us and there was a bloke behind us um, in a balaclava. And, and my mum's still tough now, but back then she had to be really tough, you know, a bit like a, a lioness sort of protecting mm. the kids because, you know, my dad wasn't about that much. He wasn't in prison the whole time, but he, drive, he, he drove um, trucks like on the continent and that. And so he was always away for a couple of weeks at a time, um, but he'd always be doing something. And that's when these people had come round just to send a message, really. So I can't fully remember how long we were in the kitchen and what was going on, but uh, we managed to, to get out of there anyway, and we got in the car, and then um, a bloke came in front of the car and um, and just put his finger up to his lips as if to say shush to, to my mum. And so we, we were all just sort of sat there but uh, and then let us go. But um, again, at the time, 
you don't think it it bothers you that much because it was quite normal. Um, Fuck. When you think about it now, you think fucking hell. But um, but at the time, it was just like, oh, this is just what happens. And because you don't know anything different, just like with regards to what's cool in school and stuff, when you don't know what's anything different, it's sort of normal. So. Mm. Um, so it'll be tough for my mum with that. It wasn't tough for us really, but it'll be tough for her because uh, we weren't fearful of anything because you you don't quite understand what situation you're in and the danger that's there, mm-hmm. you know, because you can't really comprehend what's going on with these like guns and stuff and all sorts of bits and bobs that's going on all the time. But because of things like that happening, it spreads around sort of Bradford um, and people just, just get to know you um, and you adopt that role. Mm-hmm. So you sort of turn into a tough guy and, you just convince yourself that's that's who you are, um, and you just you know do a lot of evil things, and um, you know s- some of the stuff that happened is because when you get your name around, um, there was this guy I, I won't mention his names or all, but he must have been in his thirties, and um, he used to, after a couple of months of doing whatever, he used to come and pick us up um, after school. So I must have been twelve, something like that, or thirteen. He picked me and two of my mates up after school rather than us getting the bus back to where we needed to go. And he would take us to Cross Flats, which is another side of Bingley. Um, and one way or another, there'd be someone in there that has done something to this guy, um, whether it's stolen the drugs or robbed money or done something. And We were all kids and he would just give us hammers and just give us stuff and say, you got to teach this guy a lesson. Um, and it'd be someone that's tied to a chair in the, in a house. And uh, at the time, it was, we hated this guy on the chair because this this guy who picked us up manipulated us so much because mm. we were kids into thinking this guy's robbed from you and we'd be thinking, no way, this, this guy's robbed from you. That's bullshit. Yeah, of course we're going to help you out. And it's only through reflection now at later life that um, it was really, it was so clever that he had plausible deniability so that if this guy that got hurt that we were doing a bit of damage to ever went to the police, he's got complete plausible deniability to say, you know, he had pretty much nothing to do with it. And if we were to be caught, because we didn't have masks on, but he put balaclava on and, and his mates put balaclavas on, um, us, us three, we didn't have balaclavas on our own because we weren't sure, you know, what, what was going on mm-hmm. really. Um, if he did, if, this, if these people that we did these things to ever went to the police, you know, we were sort of 12, so what, what would they do? So it's a foolproof plan from these sort of gangsters to use us. And as sick as it sounds at the time, I absolutely loved it. Mm. I loved being that person and to be feared, like, um, whereas now you just think, how weak was I to just go with what people were telling me to do? You think that you're really strong and you're a strong person, but really a strong person would have gone, listen, th- this isn't right. I'm, I'm not doing this. I don't really give a shit what you're going to do to me. I'm not doing it. I'm going to do what's right. Whereas weak people tend to fall down that sort of gangster path and going down the path of least resistance. Like, let's just do it mm-hmm. because it's scary people that are telling you what to do. So ironically, I was being really weak by trying to portray myself as a tough guy and doing these bits and bobs of stuff. Um, so that's where it all started, really. <laughs> Sorry, I'm no, you no, off no, a bit. That's, then. Yeah, that's perfect. Um, <laughs> I want to pull it back to when, um, when you were in the kitchen. Yeah, um, that's kind of your first earliest kind of memory. Did your mum ever try to explain it to you to make help you understand? Did you ever wonder like, why are these guys in my kitchen? What's going on? Or did, or was it just? I, I get it. Like you, you're born and bred in that environment. Yeah, it, it's normal. But did. You, did your mum ever try to like rationalise it to you or explain it to you or say, it's not always going to be like this? I can't remember, you know. Yeah. I would have thought she would have done, but I can't honestly remember. Um, I can't remember. Like what you're saying is, how did you rationalise it? Like all my peers at school, this doesn't happen to them. Why is it happening to us? Mm. I can't honestly remember it. It was more just like a way of life. It was so strange how it was just normal. Um I can't honestly remember her trying to to explain why it was happening, but we were very aware. I suppose at four or five, you're not very aware, but when we start getting to sort of nine or ten, we're aware that your dad and your family are involved in some not-so-nice things mm-hmm. because he's in and out of prison, and we're going to see him in prison. Um, 
So you're aware of stuff like that. But yeah, quite a few things happened where I remember being sat with my mates and some guys came to the window and, and it just absolutely the most the scariest thing you can think of. It's pitch black outside and there's someone very, very delicately tapping a gun on the window. And then you go and have a look and you're like, fucking hell. And there's a guy there in a balaclava with a gun. And then I was going, Mom. And I went to go and get her and then they were gone. And she was going, oh, don't, you know, don't worry about it. Fuck don't yeah. worry about it. And you didn't. You were just like, right. And the sad thing is, <clears throat> no disrespect to anyone on the force or police or anything like that. But there was that sort of thing where you, you deal with things yourself. Um, so in that situation... 99.9% of the public will call the police and say there's a guy who's just tapped on the window with a gun, mm. whereas it wasn't our our way of doing things, really. Um, and obviously the, the police are great. They're there to help you all the time, but it, it was the culture that it wasn't our way of life, really. Mm-hmm. So, again, it's that dealing with your own problems that I think has moulded us into the people we are today as well. Wow. So do you have do you have any brothers or sisters that you grew up along with? Yeah, two older brothers. Two older brothers. Um so yeah, one of them's less than a year apart from me. Nathan, I work with him in um, in property now, just just in Leeds and and across the UK really. Um, and then my oldest brother Adam, he's got a tattoo studio in Bingley. Right, it's going really well. He's, he's successful there. So uh, yeah, we've all just sort of turned into entrepreneurs really. Wow. I bet you were a bit of a nightmare when you were younger. Then, well, like you're painting a bit of a picture. So your family have got a bit of a name. And you got two older brothers. You probably thought you were bulletproof when you were a kid. Oh yeah, I would hate to have kids like like I was. <laughs> <laughs> I would hate to have three boys like we were. Every weekend, something else would happen. Um, not just like p- police dropping you back off at home because you've done something, but um, just we were just absolutely mental, falling out of trees and splitting heads open, and um, getting fights just playing football with your mates and. Someone kicks you in the head with a bloody studded <laughs> boot. And yeah, just nearly every single weekend you were coming back and running back to the house with like blood pouring out of somewhere. Mm. And obviously my poor mum was just by herself. But um, she was tough as well. So we got a few clouts from her like. But um, but yeah, I would hate to have three boys like we were um, when I eventually have kids, you know. So yeah, we were an handful big time. <laughs> So you mentioned when you were 13, there was a little bit of a turning point where things started to change. So what actually changed in that in, in that time? So um, my mum my and my dad were, were both... So my dad was out of prison, obviously, at that point. They were both working um, and doing legitimate things, but my dad was obviously... So to paint a picture about him, he would... He was he was well embedded with some really serious guys, um, like, worldwide. So he would um, take any sort of drugs outside of the UK to wherever it needed to be delivered and then bring um, a couple of million pounds worth of cash back to give to, you know, the dealers or whatever, the, the powers that be. And uh, he got paid a lot of money whenever he did stuff like that. So he went from being, you know, on this sort of council estate in Bradford to a detached five or six bed mansion with a cottage and grounds. And it was just unbelievable you know, this like million pound house and it was just a, a massive transition. There were Range Rovers and all sorts of stuff that we had and it was cool. It was like the coolest thing ever. <laughs> and we went to this private school and for me, this was the biggest like turning point of my life because we went there and it was embarrassing how we were. So especially how I was, it was chavy. It was like, oh, this chav, because all these wealthy people mm-hmm. at this private school it's not cool to act how we acted back in Bradford. It's now you've got to be a gentleman and you've got to be clever. That's what the birds like. And the birds like it if you're good at sport. So it's not cool to be a tough guy. And it's a completely different sort of culture altogether. Mm-hmm. Um, and, it, and it changes you. And it's, it saved me because who knows where I would be. You know, probably dead if... Um, if we'd have stayed there and not moved over to this completely different world is what it seemed like. And it's literally an hour away, Bradford to York, you know, it's not even that far, but it's a completely different world. And it's the people that, that build that sort of world and environment around you. So yeah, that's that's what changed when I was sort of 14 when we moved over there. Mm. How hard was it be to get accepted by your peers? How, how long was that 
figuring out process of, oh, I can't be a proper hard little cunt in yeah. here. I've got to be nice, I've got to be sound, I've got to try hard. Like, took, that was a tough lesson, that. Yeah, yeah. It took a long time because I didn't give a shit about what anybody thought about me. You know, I didn't want to impress them and be like, oh, I want to have friends. I didn't care. Um, I didn't want to be there. You know, the first month, for me personally, because I can't speak for my, my brother, but um, for me personally, it was really hard because I didn't have any mates, nobody I had anything in common with. I stayed by myself and people took a wide berth for me because of my persona. And it was definitely because what I was scared of. So I was scared for someone to probably come and start on me or say, you know, bully me about what I was wearing on my haircut because it was, everything was completely different to mm -hmm. them. So we had like chavy haircuts. We wore rock pots. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> yeah, wore rock pots to school. And it was like, you know, whereas these guys were, were you know, and, and again, you know, when you like, you, you roll up your sleeves and you, you, your tie's a little mm. bit looser. That was like normal, wasn't it? Back in, back in the, um, well, w where we were anyway, in Bradford. But then you go there and you get into a lot of trouble if it's not like a Windsor knot um, and to, to carry yourself differently and stuff. So initially you, you always fear what you don't understand and um and I, I couldn't quite understand it why there was no one there like me um but then after a while yeah I would say after about a month it, it was really tough I was writing letters because also the house didn't go through in September it went through in like December but we'd got into this school first mm -hmm. so we boarded because it's a boarding school so there's a lot of like um the military the military's kids that board at school because um, the parents are, are based here, there and everywhere. So um, again, you're thrown right into the deep end with all these kids that have been there since primary school and have never really had um, a home, a fixed home. They've always been in boarding. So that's really, that's their life to share like a five bed dorm with people. And then like clockwork, it's a bit like military, you know, your dinner's at this time, you've got to do your washing at this time and all this sort of stuff. So I'm, I'm put in there and, you know, the language that we've got and stuff is completely different to theirs. Mm -hmm. And uh, and and they didn't like it. You know, they didn't want to be affiliated to me. So I used to write letters all the time saying, I'm, I'm fucking done. If you don't come and get me, I'm just going to run off somewhere. Mm -hmm. And again, that's a really weak approach to it. Rather than trying to face it and and, uh, and tackle it head on, I just wanted to run away because, um, because I couldn't get on with anyone and I wanted to go back to Bradford. And again, just with regards to resilience, it was um, it was my mum that, that wrote back to me and she was just like, just stick it out, you're going to be all right. Just get in with the rugby lads and stuff like that. And eventually that was it. I started to get to know a couple of rugby lads, but then unbeknown to me, organically, I just started changing myself. Um, and again, you go out and then, you know, after a couple of years, you start going out at sort of 16, 17, don't you? You mm -hmm. just... You just do it. And that sort of thing, what people were wearing on a night out and stuff is completely different to what, what they used to wear in Bradford where, you know, if ever, because obviously we weren't drinking or going out, but if ever we went out with like the older lot um, in Bradford, they'd always want to dress like gangsters um, and look like that. And the only way I can see it is because they don't want people to mess with them. And so they want to put this persona on. Whereas over there, it was like, wear the trendiest gear spend a lot of money on an outfit to go on a night out because you want to get the birds mm. and look cool and people to guys and girls to come and, and like you, you know? Um, so yes, yeah, so that's, that's what changed. It, it was honestly, it, I can't, ex it's very difficult to explain it, but from going from a, a council estate to, uh, you know, this detached mansion, um, just unbelievable, really thrown into the deep end with a completely, different culture shock that's uh, yeah two opposite end of the spectrum exactly like you yeah. say that, yeah yeah definitely but i don't know like we can't don't get me wrong i'm not we're not saying that we're from your background but we can kind of relate because we got into sales and like i grew i grew up in bradford i lived in bolton woods like oh Bolton yeah. Woods, right yeah, yeah, so, yeah you know i went to beckford oh yeah no <laughs> right? way yeah yeah that's yeah. class and uh Julian, like you, when you moved over from Mauritius, you lived in Armley in Leeds. Yeah. Oh yeah. So we've been around that environment, and then through sales, we've kind of you, you get exposed to people that are very wealthy mm -hmm. or from uh, private schools. Yeah, yeah. And then you you, you realize and like you realize that you have loads in common. Yeah, yeah. It's like you can have a laugh with these people, but at first, when you like, at school, you think, what the fuck are these yeah. posh bastards? Like, how you I would never get on with them. Yeah. What was the first thing? Was it? Like you mentioned rugby, was that solely the first thing that kind of brought you together with these lads that yeah. you started to make friends and bond in a 
something that's kind of universal. That sport is a universal thing, right? Of course it is. So it's it's the whole thing about it, the camaraderie. So um, football, rugby, any sort of sport that you do, <clears throat> you're more than likely going to be part of a team, even boxer. At the end of the day, it's just one-on-one, but you've got a full team behind you and you'll be training with mm-hmm. other boxers. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, that, that was, uh, of course, that was it. I think, again, weirdly enough, I've only just thought about it now, actually, but like the SAS show, stripping your right back, when you're playing sport and stuff like that, you don't really have much else on your mind apart from trying to play and be your best. Mm-hmm. And it, so I think it's a bunch of guys and it's raw emotions coming out, like trying to be the best and and, uh, and win rather than all those all the other bits of society and crap that comes with it. Yeah, I think sport probably strips, strips you back. So that was definitely the thing that broke down all the barriers with people because regardless of your age or background or anything, when you're playing on a team, you're all just part of a team, aren't you? And it's a bit like um, a bit like a brotherhood, like it was mm. with SAS, really. So, And I think that's what a lot of people search for. It's that brotherhood that, you know, having people that you know you can relate with. And I think that's why a lot of people are being gangs and, you know, John, the big being part of a group to, to feel like the part of something. Yeah, you've definitely hit the nail on the head there because you feel safe as well, just like at school, when you're part of a rugby team, you suddenly feel safe or part of any team. If you've got two or three mates, you don't even play sport. That's kind of a team and it's it's safe. And you're exactly right with regards to gangs and, and like where I grew up, you, you felt safe. And it was it was really the norm as well that people outside of that environment were weaker and lower than you. Mm. Um, and so you convince yourself, just like the mind is so powerful, you convince yourself that you're powerful and that, Um, And it's a safe environment. And yeah, uh, I think one thing that um, I've thought about as well since coming out of this program, I know I bang on about it a lot, but um, you know, like uh, in different countries, they've got um, like, uh, like we've got to do military training and it's mandatory. National service is it. South Korea is a big one, like two years or something. Yeah. Yeah. That would be sick if they brought it to this country. Because when you get to that age, between sort of 10 and 15, that crucial age where you're sort of making decisions and where you want to go, um, you're so palpable to be manipulated, to go down the wrong path, that you think that you want to be part of something exactly like you've said, the brotherhood, to be either part of a gang or um, a group that's, that's just a not great group, basically. Whereas if you've got that, where it's national service, where you get it out of your system, where you go off for two years. That's, I think, how they do it in um, in Greece as well. Mm-hmm. You go off for two years and they sort of, um, uh, you go through all the mil- military training um, and uh, you, you, the way you carry yourself and everything and, and being with a, de- with a team that's structured and regimented to then come out and you've sort of got it out of your system rather than, feeling safe going into sort of being part of a gang and and all that people are doing is using you basically and you feel because I felt awesome you know and I felt like I was cool and it and I really enjoyed it when really it's just because you're being manipulated to feel that way Mm -hmm. um because when you think about it now it sounds sick doesn't it like oh you what you loved at the time when you were 12 doing stuff like that to people and you're like yeah actually I did it sounds absolutely mental now but at the time yeah because you just it just controls you, you're manipulated. So uh, you see as that then, so being 14, you're, you've gone over there, 15, 16, you're starting to see the world yeah. differently. I presume you, you know, your group of friends, were they still the same in Bradford? Did you start, was there a change where you'd go back and you'd be like, oh, wait a minute, I'm not this kind of person anymore or was did that ever happen? It was strange because you would think I would. I wouldn't want to lose my friends in Bradford, but I did. It was really easy to cut ties mm-hmm. and I actually never went back. Um, I just had my new friends in York and that was it. Um, and the local side that I played sport with and stuff, um, and that was it. That was my friends. But then I started, um, I went to Hull University and g- got some really good mates there as well. And this is where another change happened in my life where um, it was round about when I was 18. Um, my, my dad stole the money that he was supposed to give to these gangsters. And he did that a lot. But this time it was it was around about a million quid that he nicked. And uh, obviously they, they're not too bothered about the money because that's just a bit of a drop in the ocean for them. It's more the message that they don't want people to think he can steal money and get away with it. 
So he nicked this money and sort of went on hiding because at the same time, as stupid as it sounds, um, he was on run from Scotland Yard because he got caught in France with a load of drugs coming back in a container um, that he was driving. So um, he was held in a prison in France for a few days and then they deported him to the UK and he was on bail for a couple of months and then he was supposed to go back and he didn't. He was just on the run, basically. And I think this is what happened. So he's not the smartest of people, but he's got a big heart and he just thought, I need to provide for my family and whatever. So I'm just going to nick this money and then that'll sort us out then. But he could never be with us because he was always on the run because there was always people watching us and... Uh, with, if it weren't the police and whatever he was running from, it was people who wanted to kill us because we had to, it was like a daily routine and it was just, you don't think about it. We got under the cars every time we set off just to see if there was all attached to it. And now and again, there'd be a man-made, like homemade device, um, tracking device. It's like, I don't even know how it worked, but it's like a mobile phone and then duct tape with loads of bits and bobs. And we'd find it and like, oh, there's a fucking another one there. Um, take it off, you know, and then starting to get a bit clever and, and maybe drive drive off somewhere with it and attach it to another car. Um, just to, you know, stuff like that. But anyways, um, about two months after he stole it, um, we all got attacked at the house and it was a real bad one this time. So stuff had happened throughout all, up until we left Bradford. But then this time it was it, it was really bad. We could tell that they were there to kill us. And that was in the York house, so he didn't yeah. there. Okay. Yeah, so um, my mum and my brother had just arrived in the Range Rover and I'd seen this car and it's always nice cars around our house, but this was an old silver Escort and it looked like there were a few guys in it. So I was a bit wary of it. It was just, um, it, you know, it shouldn't have been there really. So then as I walked to the back of the Range Rover, as they got to the gates, I said, oh, I'm just going to check this car out. And before I knew it, it pulled up all the doors opened and, and we were just rushed by loads of guys with metal bars. Um, and you can't think to do anything. So as they were running towards me, they maced me in the face um, with this, like, obviously with, with this mace thing and, uh, and threw me into the back of the Range Rover and I could just hear, all I could hear was my mum screaming. Um, by this point, my brother had got out and they'd started pelting him with their metal bars. As I was trying to feel my way around the side of the Range Rover, I was tr- trying to open the door to, to get my mum out, but... With mace, um, which I only only found out later, when you open your eyes and expose it to oxygen, it gets worse. So every time I tried to open my eyes, it was excruciating. So you've got to close your eyes to try and to try and feel around everything. And she was just going absolutely berserk, like um, the worst noise you could ever hear. You know, your mother sort of screaming for her life. She managed to get away anyway and, and run off. Um, and then again. Uh, I opened my eyes slightly and all the guys were surrounding my brother, just absolutely pelting him with these bars. So as I ran towards him and then opened my eyes and then closed my eyes and opened my eyes, I found that I was surrounded by him um, and he had gone because it's it all happens in the space of sort of 20, 30 seconds. So I managed to get away from him then and we were running down the lane and um, we have a joke about it now, a bit like... <laughs> to try to try and get it's it's what we do we even have like it sounds it sounds awful but you've got to stay with me the type of person i am and the family are that even at funerals we have jokes about stuff because we think that laughter sort of heals you mm. so we have a joke about this horrible situation where he clearly beat me because he was faster at running <laughs> at the time than me so we were both pelting it down this lane and I heard him jump back in the car. So you, you are actually running for your life at this point. Um, and I heard the car getting closer and closer. And he just about did like a front flip into this, um, into this hedge. And just before, I can see it now, I was probably seconds away from getting to this other hedge. The car hit me mm. and my ankles went underneath and my back hit the bonnet. And then they slammed the brakes on. So I got some air time and went in flying into this hedge. But I remember getting myself back up because all I was going from my head is they're, they're going to stand on my head or they're going to run over me because um, we, we just had it in our mind straight away. These guys are here to kill us. Um, so I just sort of hobbled into this house and around there again in, in York, nobody really locks the doors. So I opened the door. I remember seeing this old woman with her arm cast on. She was already on the phone to the police and I said, oh, somebody's trying to rob us. Can you call the police? And she says, yeah. So I turned around, went outside. It was just adrenaline that was carrying me at this point because my ankles were absolutely knackered. Um, and then I've, I've, I've met Nathan, um, my brother, on, it, on, on the lane, and we were like, fucking hell, are you all right? Yeah, and he goes, yeah, my head's pretty bad. And he turned around, and all his head was caved in at the back. 
it was bleeding real bad. I said, we've got to get an ambulance. But then midway through a sentence, we were like, shit, where's, where's mum? And then so we ran up the lane and um, there's like a river, real picturesque, awesome house this was. <laughs> so there's like a river and then loads of fields on the other side of it. And um, we could just see a white jacket like miles away in the corner at fields and we were going, mum, it's, it's us, you can come back, it's us. And she was going, no, no, it's not. Because she thought it was like the gangsters pretending to be her kids so that mm. she'd come back. And um, we ended up saying, fucking hell, we're going to have to go get her. So we jumped in the river and waded through the river and we, we managed to get to her and it was pissing it down in the middle of this field. And we all just sort of huddled together in this field um, and she was just crying in hysterics. But I remember I put a hand on the back of my mum's head and then I went to put my hand on the back of my brother's and it was just like totally covered in blood. So I just put my hand on his shoulder and I didn't want to worry him that his head's like bleeding real bad. So then I um, ended up calling an ambulance anyway and it only came to the bottom of the lane. So I had to leg it with my ankles absolutely fucked, like to the bottom of the lane. I was like, guys, wh- what are you doing? They said, oh, there was a woman that said she, she saw someone had a gun, so we can't, um, the ambulance can't come down because uh, we're going to have to wait for armed police. So I was like, fucking hell. So we had to wait for ages before they came and they said they wanted to glue the back of his head up, but it was we were all sort of... Um, adrenaline was still going um, he didn't end up having it done in the end but um, but yeah and then so, so it was that and we had to leave that house in York and um, we, we stayed at my nan's for a bit in Bradford and my mum dyed her hair and it was just like again changing and adapting to try and get away from these guys um, and then yeah th- we tried selling selling the house but then they um, they broke into the house and put t-shirts on top floor it was like three floors really big house put t-shirts in the sinks um and in the baths and um and f- turned the water on because uh when an estate agent came he called us uh, one afternoon and said fucking hell you're gonna have to get here it's it's fucked all the floors had all caved in because it, all the water Sounds had been true. going for days um so uh so the stuff like that we we couldn't really get away from it so then we, we were in bradford then we were back in Bradford um, and uh, I was just living with my mum and my brother. I, I ended up trying to get a job at a um, Bradford and Bingley building society. And then after that, I was like, fucking hell, I'm going to have to sort my life out here. So I w- ended up going to Leeds. Um, Leeds met and studying law there. So three years later, I got my law degree and um, we were getting investigated. I keep jumping backward and forth, sorry. <laughs> but um, it came out after this, after we were attacked. Um, police were really hot on us then around York and they'd worked out that Dean, my dad, had nicked this money and he um, it wasn't, it wasn't clever at sort of cleaning it. So he'd just put it, he'd set up uh, bank accounts in our names because we were sort of 18 at the time, just wanted our passport and said, I'm setting up accounts and you just do it when it's your dad. Mm. So, um, so we did and he set up a couple of accounts in our name and put a couple of hundred grand through it and then drew it back out and thought he'd <laughs> sort of cleaned it, yeah. So there was a three-year investigation, literally on the dot, three years. And so when I finished my degree, um, we were going to Hull Crown Court um, and and we were getting convicted of conspiracy to, to launder money because they said we should have known, we shouldn't have let somebody take our, our um, ID and set up accounts. And it's a message to other people as well, you know, to set an example that you don't allow someone to do this to you. So um, we ended up getting convicted they played us like pawns, so um, it was really bad the way they did it, the way the judge did it. So he said, I'll give you 10 minutes now. If you plead guilty, I'll give you a non-custodial sentence. Um, but if you want to if you want to go to trial, there's a chance you could go to prison for a long time. So we went and spoke to our barristers and they said, yeah, just plead guilty, take it. And just um, it was 280 hours community service and six months on house arrest. Um, just take it. So we're like, sweet, yeah, but we don't want to do all without knowing what my mum's going to do. Because mm. she's also on trial, and um, a couple of my cousins were on trial as well. I said no, there's no time, there's no time, and it was all really rushed, and we were played. So we pleaded guilty, and then they said to my mum, literally ten minutes after the judge goes, once he'd got us to plead guilty, uh, I cannot give you the same offer. Wow. Um, you either go to trial or you plead guilty, and you might go to prison, but I can't promise you you won't go to prison. So she ended up going to trial. And she fucking bless her. She she ended up going to prison for eighteen months. She lost. So uh, because she was older and she was the wife of the the guy, she should have known that when he was putting two hundred k through her account, she should have said no. Sort of thing again. Um, 
So there's this like beautiful, lovely mother that she is now going to prison with a lot of murderers at bloody Wakefield. That's where they sent her. Um, yeah, and it was awful to see her there, you know. Mm. And she's back in the day, she used to be a scrapper, but she's not a scrapper anymore. She's she's just a mum, you know, just a lovely person. So that was pretty awful. But anyways, I, I ended up getting my, my dream job as a solicitor um, d- during, like, literally within a couple of weeks of being convicted. Um, and that was in Huddersfield. Um, so I'd get on the train and go there. And uh, I'd, I'd always remember it was, it was summer. It was proper hot, but I had to wear two pairs of socks to pull it over the tag that was on my ankle so they couldn't see it. <laughs> and uh, and anyways, it came out in the papers, like, um, I don't know, a couple of months after the conviction, it came out in the papers because the bosses came to me and mm. said, uh, this has just come out in the papers. Um, I'm sorry, we can't be affiliated with, with someone who's, who's in the limelight like this and for all the wrong reasons. So I got sacked. Um, and then I, I won't tell you which supermarket it was, but I was like, shit, I just need money because I had an apartment in Leeds. I applied for a supermarket, but I had to be honest about my conviction. And rightfully so, I don't blame them that I couldn't get a job Fuck, yeah. in a supermarket. Yeah. So it was a crossroads for me. I could either go back to Bradford and go down the easy road, which would be to roll with some of my old mates and just be a drug dealer or be whatever I needed to be. Or go down the hard road and know that I'm not going to be employed anymore. I'm going to have to set up my own business. Uh, And my brother was the same. No one would hire him. So we both decided, let's go into business together. Got this, um, a lease on an office that we couldn't afford in Bradford. Um, Started telling people we'll we'll sell the properties for free just to get our boards everywhere. And within three months, just being, to be honest with you, it was quite easy because there's a lot of rogues in Bradford. Um... And unfortunately, the estate agency world, especially in Bradford, is just full of a lot of lot of rogues and a lot of people taking advantage of people with money. So it was quite easy for us to be successful because we were just two honest guys mm. saying, this is how much we value it at or this is how much we'll rent it out for. And we did what we said we would do. And word started getting round that go with these guys because they'll look after you, you know. And that's exactly what we did. And then sort of 10 years later, we've got um, a group now that, Literally 2019, we, we turned over 74 million quid. So um, it's mental how lucky we've been to be able to to do that. But again, it's t- to send a message out to people, if especially people coming out of prison, you might think um, I'm fucked here. Nobody's gonna hire me because of you've got to be you've got to be honest with your convictions, don't you, when you're submitting your mm-hmm. applications. But it's not the be all and end all. Um, it sends people back into crime. And it very nearly happened to me. I, I just thought, you know what, fuck this. I'm not going to get employed by anybody. My only option is to just go back and uh, and do this because all your mates have got nice cars and, you know, it, it can pay off, you know, that sort of li- life of crime. But not forever. You'll be forever looking over your shoulder mm-hmm. for the person who's coming after you. Whereas if you do the hard thing, which is to not give up and just keep trying to, you know, give yourself the best life, um, then you, you can you can do it. You know, hopefully my story is proof that if you just stick to it, you can do it rather than uh, forcing people back into crime because you don't have the opportunities. Mm. What was the biggest lesson that you've carried through your whole life from where you grew up? One single lesson. Um, probably that... Mm, that's a good question. Um so from growing up, so let's just say before I moved to York, mm-hmm. the yeah. biggest lesson there. That you keep with you today. That I keep with me today as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. So definitely the biggest lesson that I keep with me today is to avoid all trouble, is to just avoid it. Mm-hmm. So whoever you are, whether you're a tough guy or somebody who wants nothing to do with it, you're always going to find yourself in a situation where you're confronted by something and you can always control it and avoid it. It literally happened to me the other day in the car where I was chewing chewing gum and a guy thought I was saying wanker to him underneath. That's the only thing I can, I can say. <laughs> he pulled up next to me. I was letting him out because I would, because it was a road and there was cars the other side. So I was letting him out, but I was chewing chewing gum. And he put his window down and I put mine down. And I thought he was actually going to say, this is me being a fucking... Having um, my head up my ass, I thought it was going to be like, "Oh, you're James from SAS." But, 
<laughs> but it was like, have you got fucking something you want to say to me? And I was like, about what? And he goes, you just said wanker underneath your voice. And I says, no, I didn't. I don't want any trouble. I'm all right. No, I didn't. Sorry. It's because I'm chewing chewing gum, you must have thought. And he started going absolutely nuts. And, and he was in a tow truck and he says, I'll fucking tow your car and all this shit. So I just waited for him to go and just carried on. I think that's the biggest lesson because some people think that you are not a real man or a real woman or whatever by walking away from trouble. Mm. Whereas really you're more of a man and you're more of a woman to walk away from stuff like that. Lesser people think, or oh, I've got to stand up for myself here and you've always got to fight, never run. There's so many songs out there and motivational things saying, yeah, I always stand my ground and I'll fight anybody and stuff like this. But it's stronger people, a tier above those people that are the ones that are probably quite capable of having to do, but would prefer to just walk away. Mm. Um, that's probably the biggest lesson I carry with me today that I would never, you know what it's like in nightclubs and stuff where people kick off at you and stuff. I'll just put my hands up every time and say, no, I'm okay, thank you, you know, mm. sorry. You know, even if it's not your fault, listen, sorry, just massage their ego a bit just to avoid it. Tomorrow's a new day. Whereas you could get into a scrap with someone and people die. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, that's probably the biggest lesson. It's from, like, the way you tell your story and, like, how it all, like, pitches out in front of me, it's like you've had to just adapt all the time. Like all, like more than any, more than a lot of people will have to in their life, and, and into like ex, in, in, in an extreme way, like yeah. you're going into kind of not extreme poverty, but you're in a like a, a tough Lower environment, yeah. right? Then you're in kind of not extreme wealth, but in the school system, you're either you know public or private. Yeah, that's course. it. We're not either. And there's yeah. a big jump between the two. Adapt again, and then you go back to go back. Kids. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's yeah. Have you always looking back now? Do you think it was conscious, or do you think you always had that kind of like fluid approach to be around people? Yeah, I think you've definitely hit the nail on the head. That if I was conscious about it, I don't think I would have been able to cope. It was more. This is what it is now. Let's sort of deal with it. Even though I didn't think this is what it is, let's deal with it. It was just sort of like you say that fluid way of life. That if something were to happen now, you know, I'm really lucky. But if we were to lose the business and lose it all tomorrow, I know that it'll be all right. We'll mm -hmm. just end up trying to get a job somewhere else. You just carry on. Mm -hmm. um, there's no point worrying or being fearful of stuff like that. And I reckon that's just sort of, like you say, a fluid way of life. If I was conscious about it, I think that's what does get to people. I'm so lucky to not have anxiety and things like that. I feel so sorry for people that can't control it. Mm -hmm. Like on the course, there was um, girls like Shaq, um, and a few others that are really strong people, but they really cannot control the anxiety that goes through the mind. And I felt so sorry for him because I just cannot relate to it. Um, and which, which is proof that it is out of your control because um, I don't have it because I'm, I'm not really in control of it or anything. Whereas someone who does have something like anxiety, they're out of control of it as well. It's just one of those things. Your mind gets carried away. I think if I was very conscious of what was happening, I would probably worry and I would start to think what's going to happen now rather than like fluidly adapting, like you say. So mm -hmm. I think just on reflection, because I can't put myself in that state of mind I, I was in, but on reflection, I think it was just one of those things where you just keep going. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm sure it'll happen again. Something else will happen and you just got to roll with it, haven't you? Yeah. So kind of ties in with SAS, but because you had to adapt so much and you were in so many different situations. <laughs> yeah. Is that what kind of now when you apply for the show, like tapping in the back of your mind, like who even are you? Like you've been the, all these different people. Yeah. You've been James Priestley, who people look at like that's fucking James Priestley. Like, <laughs> his brother's really hard and his dad's this. And yeah. then you go to private school and then you're around money and then you're back. Get a law degree. Then you get a law degree. <laughs> yeah. You get fired. Yeah. For, yeah. Do you just think like I've done too many things to be one person? Because when you see other people, you say, Josh Warrington. Boxer, yeah. done. Box. That's where you are. Yeah. So and so, like, if I look at you now and I didn't know you, like James Priestley, SS who does Yeah. Done. Right. Yeah. But in your own mind, you have this complex like thing of, oh, what do people think I am? Who actually am I? Trying to mold it into something, and course. you can you can fuck your mm, mind, right? Of course. You're torn. You are torn. To that's exactly the second reason why I went in. 
up there. To be honest with you, there's no first and second. It was up there with, you know, who, who are you? Um, the identity thing with regards to being in control of your life, you can prepare for who you are. But like what you've just said, the amount of different people that I have had to be, you don't know which one you are, which is why when you're growing up, you know, up until I moved to York, is that actually the person I am? Are you are you an evil person, really, and you're just trying to portray yourself as a good person? Or are you a good guy and you do sort of some bad shit now and again? But although I'm a million miles away from all that stuff, it does, it, it's in the back of your mind, of course. You've been so many people, you think, what sort of person am I? So you're right, leading up to SES, that was totally the motivation for me going in to identify what sort of person you are. And on the show, they actually really took a big effort to, to say, like, this guy, doesn't, he actually is quite closed off. I remember yeah. watching it, and then if you see someone's local, you kind of pay more attention to them. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah of course. I remember they were just, like, digging it, like, he just gets through everything, but he just keeps himself to himself. Like, and even, because uh, they had a mole on the series, right? Yeah, yeah, Jay. There was, like, a guy that is part of SAS, like, the team. Right. But these guys didn't know. And they put him in between them all. So it was, like... He knew what they were saying, like when they were just chilled out, or ah, okay, who's yeah. struggling really, and yeah. so it was, they had a bit more inside information inside than any of yeah. yeah than any other series. Yeah, it was like us speaking here. It was just like one of the other recruits, <laughs> and then we had no idea he was actually a mall and he was getting intel on everybody. So when you were sat there getting kind of like interviewed by like Anne and the guys and the yeah and the, and the staff yeah. Were you kind of conscious of like I don't really want to tell them that much stuff, even though you know you went there to find out what sort of person you are or yeah. who you are or whatever like that, that it's, it's like kind of like a battle of it is yeah, yeah. these guys are because they're quite hostile I guess yeah. so it might kind of draw you back to being like in your childhood like yeah these people are quite course not that does. nice so course maybe I'm does. not going to tell you too much stuff yeah <laughs> honestly it was exactly like that when I first went in I was in front of Billy and Foxy and um, the demeanour and everything about them is, is powerful and you can, they're always holding your gaze and you can't fool them, basically. And that's why they're so good. You can't fool them because they, they know. And also, you're probably too scared to try and throw a curveball and maybe try and get out of there because you know that you're going to get in trouble by them. So, absolutely, when I was sat in front of them, I didn't want to give them everything. Um, and they knew that as well because they're so good at reading you and they knew that I was holding something back. That's when Billy said, listen, we're not angels. All of us have got a past. Um, we're here now, we're talking about it. But he said he was in a gang when he was nine um, and he got stabbed, you know, and all this sort, sort of stuff. And he's, when he goes on tour and he talks about it, it's a good thing. And that's, what, that's what's changed me with regards to a lot of people keep it inside mm. because they think that's better to keep it inside and not talk about it. But actually, it's so empowering to talk about it. So after Billy said that and said, you know, he could see that I was holding back. He said, listen, we're not all angels. We've got a past and this and this and this. It sort of takes your guard down and you think, all right, fuck it, yeah. So I did, I sp spoke to him about it. But even <laughs> still, you obviously don't know what they're saying behind your back until you watch the, the, um, the programme. When I left, they said, hey, you know, I still don't quite get him because I, I don't remember, but I must have still held a little bit back. Um, I don't know. It's probably just like a self-preservation thing, isn't it? Mm. You don't want to lay all your dirty washing out. But sometimes it is empowering to just do it, to just say, fuck it, this is me, and this is the worst parts of me. If you can deal with it, that's class. If you can't deal with it, I'm cool. Just, you know, don't come and egg me or whatever. Mm. <laughs> and what's really going to come, like, what's the fear? Like, once you put that shit out there, what's... The what can anyone say to you? Like yeah. You've already said it. It's like, have you watched 8 Mile? Yeah. And he disses himself the whole yeah. final round. Yeah. And the other guy's just like, yeah, exactly. that's life, isn't it? That's like the... But it takes some balls to, to, <laughs> to reflect, yeah. to, to do that. I you don't want to yeah. put up a mirror and say, you're not fucking great, really, are you? Of course. And exactly. it's horrible. Because you really, half the time, you want to be like, I'm a fucking legend. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, of course. And yeah. then you have to hold that mirror up and be like, James. Yeah. You're a bit of a prick sometimes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Or all tough, time. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Must be a James thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I think you, you use that word right. It's, it's fear. It's the fear of what people will think. And 
when you release that fear and stop giving a shit about what people think, that's when you can just lay out the worst parts about yourself and be cool with it. Mm-hmm. And as soon as you do that, you can start moving on, can't you, with your life rather than holding on to it. So, yeah, I guess you kind of even, you might see the world differently, you know, how you process things, how you look at things. That is exactly it. And something, a massive experience like that going on the program has changed me forever and I look at things differently. So, um, yeah, of course. It's amazing, man. It's an, like, an amazing story. That's it's cool. an amazing story to like see it and then you actually I I was excited to, to talk to you anyway because I knew it'd be fucking sick. Mm. That's cool. But then actually to sit with you and see it. Yeah. It's it's amazing. So when you started your property business, yeah. How many people around you were supportive or and the, and then second question, how many people said it won't fucking work, mate? It's yeah. just like you are a criminal, like you've always been. And yeah. Then maybe you had that battle in your mind as well. Of course. Well to The easiest way to answer the question is everybody said, you're not going to fucking do it. So everyone (laughs) said, why are you doing it? You know, because we were from day one in debt. Mm. (laughs) So to to be able to think when you have, all right, we had we had not much to lose because we had nothing. But you also have everything to lose because you're trying to do something. Um, To be able to see where it's going to be in a year is almost near impossible but we just kept telling each other. Also, we had our own battles. You know, it's your brother. We had fights every single day. Um, to, to then sit by yourself at night and think, what the fuck am I doing? We've now put an extra 100 quid or whatever. That's all I had left in my bank. We put that in to mark it with right move. Um, what what am, what am I doing here? Because I also don't like this guy. <laughs> you know, you see, you're like, a, today I really love my brother. Tomorrow I really hate him, you know. So you, you, you're in a battle the whole time, yeah. And it's everybody around us was saying, what are you doing? Just try and get a job in a warehouse or something and just build up your, your money, get a little bit comfortable and then you, you'll be fine. Because we were living at the office as well because we couldn't afford to, to rent uh, anywhere and we didn't want to waste money on that anyway. So And the, the windows are not built properly for residential so you can hear everything and you're in the centre of Bradford, you know, you're struggling at sleep there's so much shit going on outside all the time. So, of course, not only from outside, everybody saying, just stop doing it, because I was quite negative to people because I was getting it off my chest. So I was telling them, oh, this is a, yeah, we've literally got no money, but then we've got people complaining. Mm. The people who were selling their houses for free are complaining to us, you know, and, and, and you're telling people that and they're just saying to you, we'll just fucking quit then. And then you're saying it in your in your own mind as well, like, why am I doing this? Why, why don't we do it? But then eventually you just think, right, well, you know what? Let's just see how it goes. There's no point quitting. If we keep going until the wheels come off and we crash and there's nothing else to do, all right, cool, we'll stop, we'll try something else. But you go until you're broke, basically. And it's, it's holding on to that hope that as long as you have a little bit of goodness every week, once a week, whether it's in business or just in yourself, because we used to do a lot of boxing back then and we were getting fitter and we could tell our bodies were changing. We were using that as a positive to then sort of trickle trickle down from everything else, yeah, rather than just relying on business and saying it's not worked. After day one, after week one, after month one, it's not working, we're just losing loads of money to then still just keep going. Um, So, yeah, it was... uh, I remember getting close to the point of just saying, fuck this. Um, and again, just saying, fuck this, let's just go, let's just go back to Bradford. Let's have a chat with the lads and see what we can do to make that quick cash over a weekend. Mm. But again, it's those weak moments where your mind from a biological point of view is wanting to protect you. So it wants you to do the easiest option, doesn't it? Mm. It don't want you to keep on fucking going in the office 12, 13 hours a day and then sleeping upstairs in the office. And then your mind is trying to convince you as well stop doing this so it's tough yeah but um luckily you know we got through it oh you know what, yeah it's weird i was gonna say the mind in it it's just like it's a wonderful and crazy things you know in that point to be able to know that you should be doing something different your mind is telling you something but you know deep inside you want to do yeah do what you want to do so it's i appreciate yeah. that a lot man. yeah it's, 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 i was gonna say like we had luke ambler on our podcast last year and he said, like, one thing that he notices is that everyone wants everything right now because everything's on Instagram. Like, I look at your, I look at your Instagram today, and all I see is James Priestley, property, like, successful within property. Right. That's, That's cool. all you see, right? Yeah. And people might not the same level. Don't get me wrong. 
people look at us like, oh, it's all right for you guys. You do 76 podcast episodes. Your podcast, yeah, it's all right for you. And people don't see all the, people just don't see all the shit. Yeah, and then, of course. Then you, then you start winning at the last tiny bit. And then everyone notices like, oh, this, oh that's really cool. That must have been really fun. Like, yeah. No, easy. no, it's hard. And it's, do, you, do you see that more and more in younger people? I don't know how, if you're around younger people or maybe people that come into your business, like yeah. start, you know, like trainees or, or juniors or whatever. Yeah. Do you see that like, oh, out, they've been there three months and they want a promotion or they want this and, and they want that and they're not, not that they're not willing to work for it. Yeah. But so, for some reason, they feel like it should be like hyper speed. Like, I just need all this. I don't need that experience. Just like, give me that next job. Give Cause. me that next pay rise. Give me that next commission check. It does happen. Do you a see lot. that as a business owner and uh, yeah, absolutely. And I think it stems from their role models, which might be the parents that are saying to them, "You might as well ask for it because uh, one of the worst things, but it's not one of the worst. It can be one of the best, but it can be one of the worst is that advice that someone says: if you don't ask, you don't get. Mm. Because by asking, you could ruin your future by somebody's response. Because I, I always like to look after the staff. We've got um, like 11 staff now. So I always want to look after them. And you spend the majority of your life at work. So I want them to be happy because otherwise you'll just turn around in 10 years time and think, what the fuck have I been doing? So I want them to be happy during work and to come to their manager and to even come to me if they want. There's no hierarchy. We're all, it's a democracy. People take the piss out on me and we just, you know, we try and have a good time. Mm -hmm. But as well as being real high a high level of professionalism as well within property but um yeah apprentices people like that they, they want to change quick one of the biggest things i've seen is i've been doing some um, lectures at bradford uni just to the entrepreneurs there there's like an entrepreneur course and during the final year of the masters i just go and tell them about my experience and hopefully even if it's just one person it'll cut their learning curve and they'll think all right i'll change i'll do this but the majority of them have had the approach exactly what you've said oh, i've been doing it for not just three months but maybe they've been doing it for a year now and nothing's changed and they wanted it to be big and to be a millionaire after a year mm -hmm. but you know that it takes time and it's painful and the journey is good you know of course like you said at the very last minute when you win and it's good and everybody's like oh these guys are, are killing it and stuff it's like yeah but we started so long ago and the hours and everything, and like you like you said before, all the mistakes you make leading up to now is the journey. You should mm -hmm. enjoy it. Um, so yeah, it's, there's a lot of people that want to do it quick. And you know what? They might idolise someone who has luckily done it quick. You know, within a couple of months, they've got really rich off of something, but the likelihood it is, without sounding too naive within the business culture, is it probably is luck. They've just got a bit lucky that they've something has has fit the jigsaw mold perfectly at that time at that certain place for them to do it because ninety nine point nine percent of the time it's hard work in it that that gets you to be successful and uh, having that resilience to just stick it out and think all right it's gone shit for a day a month or even a year but eventually it's going to get better so yeah how important is it to focus on just one thing because it seems like you want to focus on your proper business. You got it to a certain point, then you looked at yourself, like or it went on SAS, like oh actually, like I need to challenge myself in a different way. Yeah. Because I guess you can get to a certain amount of money, that your life's going to be completely comfortable no matter what. There is that. There must be that threshold of, I'm never going to worry about money now. Yeah. I'm not saying you're there or you're not. I don't really know. I don't really care. Yeah, yeah. But how important is it to focus on one thing? Because we've tried to do it before. I mean, like, do too much at once, mm -hmm. and you just do loads of fuck all. Yeah. <laughs> In all honesty, I think it's really important to focus on one thing, but it's also really important to not. So all right. I know I don't answer you that well, <laughs> no. but you know, like um, the nine to five model actually works. You know, it's there for a reason. It's been around for hundreds of years because it works. So even when, um, again, there's so many motivational speeches that might work for some people, might not work for others. But what worked for me was um, not listening to the generic motivational speeches that say, when you get up, you work. When you know you, if you want it as bad enough as you want to sleep or breathe, sorry, um, you know, wake up at five a.m. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's like, all right, cool. But then when you don't get it and it doesn't work, it hits you harder. Whereas if you work during and, and the quality of work compressed within a certain um, like part of time, after that, just have a rest, relax the frontal lobes by going to the gym or something like that. Don't sacrifice your health. 
because your health is your wealth at the end of the day. It's not the money you've got in your bank. Um, so yeah, I would say the advice I would give is um, not to, from the second you get up to the second you go to sleep, obsess about something. For me personally anyway, that wouldn't have worked because you eventually hit a wall. You can't maintain that. You can't, mm. whereas you can maintain a good balance. And that will, that I think is what led us to be successful because to start with, we were hitting walls. We thought it was the right thing to do to work so many hours a day, but really it's not because you can't see what's right in front of your face when you are so engrossed with it. Whereas if you step back and look at what other people are doing and have that little bit of time to relax, your mind starts getting a bit better. Um, so your quality and the curve in which you become successful is quicker rather than if you were so engrossed with it from the second you get off, get up to the second you go to bed, you're missing all the other stuff that might... Another thing is, if you're so energetic, like you guys are obviously two fit guys, you obviously go to the gym and stuff, but when you're so um, energetic, you like to do things yourself. Whereas one of the key things of becoming successful quicker is to put a laser head on mm-hmm. and say, what is the easiest way to do this? Rather than getting your hands like stuck in with it, so adopting like how stupid it sounds, a lazy approach to something. How can I make this easier for myself? Is usually the thing that cuts the the success curve as well. So no, well, you you've you, always said that you want to make it on your own terms. You know? I want to do it easy as possible. Yeah, I want. I I always have this like thing in my mind though that like sometimes I get a bit. People, I don't know what it is. Oh, he's off. <laughs> I don't know what it is, but I just never liked. Or even maybe it was at school, it was like, oh, I used to think, oh, you're just trying really fucking hard. And it and it just don't come off that well sometimes. Yeah. And that, that it's always played on my mind. But then again, like, I think we're the same. I, you say, oh, like, yeah, we're two fit guys, we're active. But we're not, like, super, like, we are lazy, we are. We set up this so it all records and we don't have to edit it. Yeah. And we press play and then it fucking lives in the little box <laughs> yeah. and we just upload it and it's gone. Yeah. Like, we don't want... We don't want to be editing for like we don't have two cameras because it's it's more work. Yeah, of course. <laughs> like, yeah, no, yeah. It's, it's one of those things like ah, oh, does it matter? It makes perfect sense. Mm. You got to look after yourself, and I I've taken a different view on it. Like you were saying, like you have to look after your own mind and take a break. Like I used to be like proper. Yeah, yeah keep going. Yeah, and I'd always get ill at Christmas because I stop. Right. So not bad, just like a bit of man flu. Yeah, of course. I mean? But it is really bad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah it's, uh, it's okay. <laughs> and the, the, recently I just thought like you have to look after yourself more than anything and take a break do. and switch off and just disconnect and yeah like you're you're really good at it like you're quite mindful of it aren't mm-hmm. you like trying to disconnect and like he's not on his phone that much and, and yeah. that sort of stuff and I had to just like switch off and, and, yeah. and get away from it but I think it's been around people like you that are, I don't even know how old you are you could be the same age as me I'm t- 31, yeah. All right, so you're not, thank <laughs> <laughs> So, being around people that have, have had more life experience than you, really, it, it's so beneficial because you kind of been there, done it, burnt out, rebuilt, yeah. learnt along the way. Like, all these people now preaching like, ah, you should do this because I do this. Like, you're fucking 16. What the fuck yeah. do you even know? Exactly. Chatting bullshit on Instagram about yeah. look after yourself and self-care and all this bollocks. When yeah. You even lived a life that's tough enough to even fucking need it. Yeah, exactly. So we sat with like Neil Smedley that owns King Kobe Barbershop. Oh, and he's yeah. like, he's ruthless. Mm-hmm. Lovely guy. Yeah. But he will just assassinate you. Or not even you, just Pete. Like, well, it's himself, himself isn't he, from his experience yeah. that he's and gone it's from through. His, it's from his own experiences. Like, you don't, like, you're not the person you think you are. And that sort of like. Right. And being around people with experience from this podcast made me realise that. I used to think the other way, like experiences bollocks. Right. I wonder all these old fuckers really know. Like, <laughs> just old. You don't live in the, in the world that we live in. And yeah. Da, da, da. yeah. And then it, it kind of humbled me a bit like, that's what fucking real life experience looks like. That's cool. That's what it actually means. And you're yeah. all the same. Like sit back and look at someone that's grafted, you know, been through all that stuff and then come out the other side and, 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 t- and took up, basically you took out a loan against yourself, didn't you? Yeah, of course. To set that business of like, it's a good way of putting I'm, it, I'm, yeah. I'm backing myself here now. Yeah, I have yeah. to. I either do this or that. And you went for the hardest option and, yeah. then, and then smashed it. Yeah, of course. And okay. then learn to look after yourself. Yeah, that's it. By doing... So what do... Like, I've been waffling on a bit, but like, I mean, what is it... What do you actually do to look after yourself? Like, outside of, like, work and all that stuff? Yeah. Like, how do you, how do you keep you... I'm a massive yourself? film buff. 
So oh, I right. honestly think from a mental point of view, so physical, I just try to go to the gym four or five times a week. But there's something I want to tell you as well that's quite exciting on the horizon for me. But um, with regards to relaxing, I love just like focusing on a film. And then mm-hmm. you are so relaxed because you, your frontal lobes are concentrated on a mundane task, which is just watching a film. So the rest of your brain really relaxes. Mm-hmm. So that's how I find relaxing. I know people like reading and stuff like that. It's not for me because um, I've never really finished a book. I'm not great at reading. I can't really put myself into that sort of imagination and people really fall into a book. I just can't seem to do it. I'd love to be able to do it mm-hmm. because it makes you more smarter. You know, when, you, when you're reading stuff and you, your English get, starts to get a lot better, doesn't it? But yeah, for me, it's films. I'll, I'm a big film buff. I like Marvel and all that mm-hmm. sort of stuff. Oh, nice. Um, and it was one of the things that got me through interrogation, you know, because when you're in those stress positions, um, it is, again, borderline impossible. Like, breaks extremely strong people. Strong-minded people, strong-bodied people break. And every second feels like 10 minutes. So what I did, because there's the crying babies, you know, there's, there's pigs as well, pig noises. And it's all sort of, it's all mental. And, um, and, and you're in excruciating pain, sat with my legs crossed, with my hands on my head. And whenever your elbows come forward a little bit, someone is there in a second, puts the knee in your back, pulls your elbows back, puts your hands back on your head. So you know mentally as well that you are not going to have a second to breathe. Whereas my favourite film is Transformers. So what I did, because I've seen it probably over, no joke, over a hundred (laughs) times, I just watched it. So I just watched that film and um, just tried to go through all the different um, scenes from start to finish, just watch that film. And it, it got me through it, taking your mind somewhere else. The reason why I brought that up is when you've had a really tough day, for me personally to relax is to watch a film and take your mind off of it. And you know what? A lot of the time after I've watched a film, I start thinking of stuff because your mind's sort of been so relaxed. You think, oh, why didn't I just fucking do this? <laughs> you know, if you've had an issue through the day. So that's that's what helps me to sort of um, keep my mind healthy because I want to relax it. Because in all honesty, it's embedded in me now and I don't want to change it. But um, I do have extreme paranoia. So, But I see it as a good thing. So with regards to people coming after me, it's unlikely, but not impossible. Mm-hmm. So I don't sleep very well. And I'm always on guard. If I think that someone's been following my car, I'll do a few loops round a roundabout. And if they don't follow me anymore, I carry on. But it's really, um, it's, it's just second nature. I don't think about it. It's just what I do. Mm-hmm. So I'm such a light sleeper. I don't sleep that much. So that's why I like to relax the brain in a different way. Mm-hmm. Honestly, some days I'll, I'll get an hour's sleep, something like that, and then I'll just be awake again. I can't control it. And people who, if anybody is listening to this, who's got sort of paranoia, I, I actually see it as a good thing that I'm on guard and you're ready for it. If something will never happen to me for the rest of my life, I'd still prefer to be on guard rather than to relax properly and yeah. um, and let it let it get away from me, basically. Let something catch you off guard. But, um, but yeah, with regards to the physical aspect of it, um, I, I'm trying to do a lot more rowing now. Right. Um, because I went into the gym one day, and I was just like, what's the thing that I hate the most? It was probably just after SAS, and it was the rowing machine. I was like, I hate that more than anything. It's the hardest thing to do. And uh, so what I've done now is um, September this year, I've got it booked in with the Guinness World Records. So I'm going to try and break the record for the longest distance road on a Concept2 rower in a gym over a 24-hour period. Wow. So, yeah, it's about um, 303,000 metres, something like that. Um, so I'm just going to, uh, yeah, try my best to, to, to try and beat that. Within 24 hours? Within 24 Jeez. hours. And if I do it, well, you know what, whether I do it or I don't, um, what I'm going for next year is to then break the Guinness World Record for the longest distance road in total um, in a, a solo uh, rower um, in history. So <laughs> um, it's, it's 9,600 kilometres is what this guy did um, back to back. He rode it over, over in the Caribbean somewhere. Um, and that's in, in over 150 days and that's currently the record so I want to do more distance than that in uh-huh. a less period of time 
Um, so that's the two things that I've got on the horizon, really, from a phys- physical aspect of challenging stuff. Um, do you know what? That's quite interesting saying that. So going to do something that you hate doing. That's yeah. like, I think with anything, there's a benefit in doing that. Like we always talk and joke about taking cold showers. Like we know they're good for you. Yeah. But you don't want to do it. But no. then after you do it, you feel amazing. Yeah, of course. It, they're terrible, aren't they? Mm. But yeah, you're right. It's um, looking at it as a good thing. So rather than avoiding the stuff you don't want to do, actually go in for it so that you don't have anything you don't want to do anymore. It's like scary films. I used to hate them. I, didn't, I don't like being jumped and surprised and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so I, won't, I certainly wouldn't watch them on my own at home years ago, but it, you would never be able to get me to cinema to watch it where you've got the surround sound and you everything's on you. Whereas after a while, it must have been about three years ago when the first It film came out, oh, you know, The Clown. Yeah. And I was like, fuck it. You know, I'm <laughs> saying, <Challenge>. yeah, <laughs> I'll go and watch it at cinema by myself. So, um, oh no, actually I did go with a mate, what am I on about? <laughs> 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 Sorry, yeah, I did go with a mate. But I've, uh, now I actually enjoy scary films because I like to be shocked. Mm. And it's more like, like you say, like um, what I was talking about with a rower, it's the worst thing and the cold showers and stuff, rather than avoiding it for the rest of your life, actually go for it. And then it's another thing that you're not really, well, obviously it's still bad in it getting in mm. shower, even worth like not showering for a week. To, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, you feel like, I don't know, you feel like that growth after, don't you? You feel like yeah, you're in a better place than you were before yeah. doing it. Yeah, yeah absolutely. So anyway. And there's less and less things that bother you. Mm. The more things you do, you don't want to do. There's less and less things that bother, bother you. you. Yeah. yeah, and you realise that sometimes it's just not, you're not that fragile. You're not that. Mm. You, you're stronger than you think you are. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I think that's a, probably like a key, like a key takeaway. Yeah, definitely. That must have been the big thing from the show, though. Like you probably did stuff that you thought I'd never be able to do that. Like how the fuck have I just absolutely finished that or yeah. done that? Absolutely. I'm the worst runner. I really hate running. I'm not built for it. I'm quite short and fat, so <laughs> it's like they're not the best runners. Mm. So long distance for me is really hard. And I tried my absolute best, trained for sort of four months every single day before we went to try and get better at running. But then there were still people who, I'm not saying they have to try less, but their natural build is just a little bit better than mine. So they were really good at running and stuff. So if you were to give me an itinerary of what we would do in those 12 days before we did it, I would think, fuck, I I can't do it. I'm just going to tell you now, I'm not going to be able to do it. But the fact that you tackle each hour, each half hour mm-hmm. as it comes um, and not knowing what's coming next, you just de- decom, uh, what do you say? Decompartmental. Yeah, yeah that's uh-huh. it. Yeah. You just do that with each thing, just small little chunks. So you've got a, a task now, right? So we've got a sickener where we're going to be running uphill with someone on your shoulders. Just think about that. Don't worry about reserving your energy because there might be some afterwards just get through that and then see what happens yeah, next, next one. yeah that's well, like your life though it's like life isn't it yeah your life yeah mm. yeah like perfect for it man yeah 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 it was uh yeah it's, it, it was mental because you, you you turn a switch on and I, I would imagine well not i would imagine i know that like boxes are exactly the same you you might not know someone is a vicious fighter and boxer by speaking to them but then they go in the ring and there's the switch and you can turn and you be somebody Mm -hmm. else so right now people might look at me and go that guy won't be able to fucking do that but you turn into somebody else and you can switch that on where you're like right yeah this is what i'm going to do i'm just going to keep going until i pass out which is obviously what one of the birds did um until your body says that's enough and switches you off (laughs) um so yeah so you, it's that's it it's adapting again like we were talking about just changing so even if you think now in this state i'm not going to be able to do it just go and do it and you might surprise yourself so yeah yeah and just stick at it man yeah, yeah. just stick at it yeah and it's it's hard to listen to someone especially if you're in hard times now i wouldn't want to listen to someone telling me oh just hang in there you know whatever I want one. I'd just be like, "Fuck off," because you'd think, wouldn't you? Mm. Yeah. Well, you are experiencing what I'm experiencing right now, but the fact of the matter is, you've you've got to step outside your own life and think, and and, and look at everything, like you say, like as decompartment and things like, right. So, uh, money is usually the biggest issue, isn't it? The biggest source of like anxiety and depression and stuff. What do you really need it for? And then to just look at it from a different angle. Mm. And other people that are really happy 
have they got less money than you and why are they happy because they've got less money and looking at it from a different view rather than just being so self-endorsed like um looking at your own issues and stuff you can't it's, it's difficult and you don't want to take anybody's advice do you mm. when you're in your worst point you just want to look after yourself and and do that but you've got to separate yourself and just have a look at everything on a smaller scale and i'm not saying people with um big issues such as gangsters coming after them is no different than someone who struggles to get out of bed in the morning the stress levels will be the same although it's a different product it's the same stress levels so why, why is it a bigger problem there's a lot of people like people that i'll rub shoulders with from the SAS and stuff really strong people but then they have days where they cannot get out of bed because they're so fearful and they've got anxiety of what's going to happen in the day and that's like with regards to someone coming to attack you it's the same level mm. and if you look at it like oh well you can't get out of bed that's fucking bullshit no but the what, how they see it is the, is is the same as how you would see someone running at you with a metal bar it's the same level of sort of stress and anxiety but it's just how they view it they view it yeah. I guess the body might be processing it the same way, you know, the chemicals are going Course. off, you're still fearing. Of course it is. The body processes it the same. It's just like a magnified adrenaline and fear on something that on the whole in the world we can say it's very small, not being able to get out of bed, you know, because you can talk to someone and tell them, listen, what is it that you fear? What's the biggest fear? And it's like, well, um, that if I go outside, um, a car's going to hit me or something like that, you know, and, the, the mind keeps on processing it and the mind is designed to protect the body. Mm. So it is telling that person, don't go outside because you might get hit by a bus and then the more you don't want to think about it, the more they think about it. But right, no, I, I can't because then also, like the coronavirus or whatever, if I go outside, uh, someone might sneeze on me or whatever and I'll get it. And the, it's the mind convincing them then, yeah, don't go outside because you might. So then they start, you know, that's it. It takes over. It's trying to protect them, but... The biggest thing I can probably advise that I give in the lectures as well from like um, a biological point of view is we can all see now the lights are on. It's it's the middle of the day. The sun is out, but it's our eyes that have put it to our brain that is telling us that it's light outside, but your brain is encased in a skull. It's never seen the light. It has no idea what it looks like. Mm. It's telling you that it's light outside. So then you can tell your brain that it's okay that everything's going to be okay because it's never seen the light, but you believe that it's light because it's telling you that it's light outside. So you believe it. So why not tell it that everything's going to be okay and then you'll just carry on with your life um, is, is one, of the, one of the biggest things that, that I try and say to people, you know, that your brain is trying to warn you from stuff that it's never seen. It's just its, it's um, job in your life is to protect you so that's why it's convincing you to to look after yourself and it can go a bit extreme sometimes can't mm. it mm. so yeah it is it, i guess you like saying it does boil down the way that you just see the world like if you can just like i don't know have a bit more of a positive outlook on stuff it, mm. it yeah. will make a difference to your life for yeah. sure like you can i'll just yeah. take stuff on the chain if it's bad yeah it's bad don't dwell on it I don't know. It's, you could go into so many you things can. from the back of that. It's, it's a control thing at the end of the day, and it T your mind is yours. It's yours. You mm -hmm. own it. It's yours. Don't let it control you. Mm. Take control of it. But some people that are so far in sort of a deep hole, you've just got to take a few small steps. If they think I'm never going to be able to go outside again, it's like all right. We'll just go outside your bedroom for a day and go back in, and then maybe go into your kitchen for a bit. Yeah. whatever and then you know keep doing that and then a year from then you'd think fucking hell last year i couldn't get out of bed and now i'm fucking climbing mount everest or whatever mm. yeah, um, you're right man it's yeah. um we both started reading the daily stoic like it's like have you, have you heard of it it's like a book by ryan holiday all oh, right it's like a it's like one page a day and it takes like parts from uh stoic philosophers like marcus aurelius and stuff like oh, that yeah and then kind of actually explains it to you because you read it sometimes and you're just like mm, kind of get it but you're too smart for me, mate. I, right. I, and plus you're from ancient Greece. Or, or, <laughs> or, we're not from the same world. Yeah. And uh, the the one thing that they say in there is like the, every like stoic philosopher always says like that if you, the one thing that you should really like prize is your mind. Like, keep, like look after it. Yeah. Make sure it's always yours. Don't give it to other people. Like don't, like let someone like kind of live in your head like rent free. Yeah. Because your body can be thrown in prison. Like someone could come in now 
and throw us all in fucking prison for the rest of our lives. Yeah. And the only thing that we can control is our mind, that though. The only <laughs> thing, because your body can be can be run over, can be fucking, and it can break. Yeah. It can be great, it can be bad, it can be good. Yeah. But your mind's always that one consistent thing yeah, that you should cool. never really give away. And right. Like with the way you were saying it, it kind of it, 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 it kind of ties in. Yeah. So I would recommend that book to anyone. Just Dead like kind of FYI, if you don't like reading, you've only got to read a fucking page, man. <laughs> <laughs> I'll <laughs> give it a shot. <laughs> 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 fucking shit. <laughs> page one. Yeah, yeah. not interested. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, I've loved it. Yeah, Boom, that's cool. a wrap from us, James. If people want to find you, they want to follow you on Instagram. They want to find your your social pages if you have any. Yeah. Where can they go? It's just James Priestley on Instagram, so just have a look for my name. Um, yeah, it'll be cool. I mean, I answer to everybody. I do get a lot of messages, but I will always answer to you. So if anybody just wants to ask me something, I get messages through. Uh, honestly, I've learned the way that two years ago, or whatever, when I first started on Instagram, I sent some messages to people, never heard back from them. Mm. You know, and I could have used that help. Mm. Whereas if any, I'm not saying I am, I can help people, but sometimes it's good just to talk to someone. Um, yeah. So just James Priestley on Instagram, uh, Jimmy Priestley on Facebook. If you want to just drop me a message um, to ask me about anything, I might take time getting through them, but I'll always, always message you back. So yeah. Boom. Thanks again. Yeah, thanks, thanks for sharing the message much. and we appreciate it. Yeah, no, it's been a fucking pleasure. Cheers for having me boys. Cheers, yeah, man. class.